are rolling. We are in it. So, yeah. Just, I, mm -hmm. You know, The White Shadow was... Well, first of all, it was a terrific show. Yeah. Uh, second of all, I'm a, I'm a huge sports fan. We had a basketball court there. Uh, I love basketball. <clears throat> um, I became good friends with John Falsey on that. As I said, we were the two guys who wrote. We were the only writers on the show. Um, there were none of the other producers wrote. Uh, and uh, and, I, and I became friends with Thomas Carter, and um, uh, uh, who has remained one of my closest friends and, on that show. And I, you know, I mean, I don't, uh, I, I, you know, by the time I wrote, as I said, it ran three seasons. I wrote six episodes in the second season, and then I was a story editor on the third. Um, and, and, you know, in, in a lot of the most interesting stuff on that show happened in the first season, some of the darker stuff that you were mm -hmm. talking about, or you had mentioned. Uh, and, um, you know, I mean... It, it, it was a, it was a great experience in a lot of ways. I mean, it was, it was one of the, you know, and and, and interesting. Thomas was a friend of mine. I remember um, years and years later, maybe twenty, thirty years later, we were um, downtown L.A. and we walked into a um, a chicken place to get some chicken or something or some fast food place. I don't know. And the people all recognized and remembered him from being, you know, Carter and yeah. uh, um, and and and. It, it was it, it was very influential for people, and in, I guess it was you know first time that they got to see other than a sitcom or something. Black people got to see African Americans got to see these guys. Now again, it had the white basketball coach, but but um, but he really was a, a basketball player too. Um, you know what's his name? Um, I forgot his name. Ken Reeves, you know, yeah. was the that wasn't his name as the actor's name, uh, but he's a lovely guy too, and um, you know, and and sort of. Uh, so, so what I got out of the show really was becoming Thomas's friend and and uh, and 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 uh, becoming friends with John and also learning one of the things that um, has stood me in good stead and they still kid me on about on the on the Americans you know it, it, one of the things that you have to be or you used to have to be on a network show where they did twenty two episodes in a season you have to write, write quickly you have to be able to or a director you have to be able to make decisions you shoot eight pages a day you know in a movie you shoot two pages a day so I have friends who are wonderful writers who aren't happy working in television because you just have to turn it over fast right. and it was something I could do and a way I like to work um, and uh, so I learned that working on the White Shadow because Falsey and I had to write all the scripts and uh, and, and, you know, there was some, the, you know, one of the shows which is not a very good show, and it was like, I, I wrote it, it was an episode, and it was like, it had the corniest title, If Your Numbers Up, Get Down, or something. It was about high blood pressure in the black community, and we had, we got all of these sort of famous athletes to be on the show. Magic Johnson was in it, but one of them was Bill Russell, and I've always been not only a fan of Bill Russell's, I don't know if you know who he is, he was the center for the Boston Celtics, mm -hmm. who... You know, one of the greatest players ever. But he was also a uh, a guy with real dignity and presence and a kind of power about him. And one of the things that, again, he wasn't a friend of mine, but um, he at all. And uh, you know, I, apparently people said he wasn't that friendly. He wouldn't sign autographs for a long period of his career and stuff like that. Anyway, he agreed to be on the show. And I remember he was sitting in my office and we were talking. And I, of course, was really, I mean, you know, like a lot of people in Hollywood, we're all starstruck by athletes, you know. Not really movie stars, but athletes, you know. That's, that, and particularly if we love, if you're a guy and you love sports. I mean, we had Mickey Mantle on the show, you know. I mean, that was like a huge deal for me. I'm, I grew up in New York. I was a baseball fan. But anyway, Bill Russell, and what I remember is, I, I, I don't know how I got into it. I was talking to him. I wanted to talk to him. And he was like not the friendliest chattiest guy in the world, but he was, he was being nice, and he said, I said, so how does being as successful as you come, how has it changed you? And he looked at me and he said, um, it doesn't. He said, it just allows you to become who you really are. Mm -hmm. And I remember that. I was like 20-something. And uh, that really stuck with me um, because it's true. You know, you, you, you think, oh, people changed. Oh, look at you, you changed. Now, people always say that because maybe, you know, you're no longer interested in being their friend. You know, it's kind of like junior high school or something. But, it, but it's true. I mean, if you're a good guy to begin with, you become a better guy. And if you're a shithead, then you become a bigger shithead. And, uh, and I found that to be true as I've sort of 
you know, move through the ranks and stuff. And um, so I got that out of the white shadow too. Um, but um, and I had fun writing the episodes. But I was I just wanted to not get fired and survive. This was my chance to sort of. You know, well, I'd gotten in. I mean, critically, though, I mean, you were nominated for Humanitas Award. I mean, yeah, what, but I, mean, I didn't know what that meant, really. You didn't at the time? It didn't nah, I mean, I didn't, it was kind of like, I didn't, I mean, I, I, maybe I knew what it was, but it didn't, it didn't, I was just, I, 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 I was back on the love boat. Yeah. You know, that's what I cared about. And I was doing something that I, I was writing something that I knew something about and that I loved, basketball. Right. And, uh, and I had you know, met two really good friends, you know, that were going to, regardless of what was going to happen, they were going to sort of stay with me through my life. Or, um, and Thomas has, you know, John has sort of drifted off. And, uh, but um, so that was really what I got out of uh, working on the show. It was, uh, it was somebody threw me a life raft. And it was really John Falsey who threw me the life raft, you know. And, uh, um, and, and, uh, um, and, and I, you know, and, and, and I suppose, again, he didn't have to leave the White Shadow, but he wanted to. Uh, I'm sorry, not the White Shadow, St. Elsewhere, mm. skipping ahead. And, uh, and, and, and that's sort of when, uh, when we, were, we were partners. I mean, that's when, because people wanted to hire us together. And, right. and, you know, at that point then I was in my 30s, I was married, I had a kid, you know, um, and, uh, and he was my good friend. And so... Um, we we then became partners, and we did the shows that came after that until the partnership ended. Um, but um, so that's that. I don't know what else to tell you about. The well, let's well let's go back to what we were talking about off camera about um, what you were talking about about you know that you're doing this medical show and they want to know that you know what you're talking about. So you were actually those three days you spent in the Cleveland Clinic, you were soaking in all of these. Well, terms. it was yeah. We I mean, it was all because of Lance because yeah. and 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 by the way, I did the same thing uh, in the police department. Oh, well, I'm jumping ahead. Uh, when Lance became a, he was a doctor. He's the only doctor ever become a uniformed policeman in New York City. What? Do a story about him? Yeah. Well, I did. We we did a pilot about it. The problem with that is uh, nobody believed it, because the real story uh, about my friend Lance is uh, he. Um, uh, should I just jump ahead? Go ahead. Or? Yeah. So. So Lance basically said somebody should do something about a teaching hospital. I sell it to Grant Tinker. I'm going to do it by myself. All of a sudden, it becomes this is going to the whole White Shadow team is being re re resurrected, and I'm one of many. I'm not happy about that, particularly since it doesn't get picked up. It's just writing a pilot. We had to write ten scripts before the show gets picked up because the network. Jeff Zagansky, the guy who basically, you know, uh, is um, oh no, he's at CBS. Then I'm sorry, that has to do with Northern Exposure. But anyway, um, so. Uh, so, so things are, are sort of repeating themselves and coming together, and decisions that have been made, and, um, and so, and I have to write. We write ten of them because this is a new form in television. It's a lot of money. The networks are concerned. You know that people aren't going to follow multiple stories without a single lead. That you're mixing comedy and drama, and of course, in a medical show, um, you know. And I said we saw a Hospital, which is. Patty Chayefsky, it's very dark. I don't even know if people would see it as a comedy anymore. You know, losing patients in a hospital. And, um, and, and so we did this, you know, so, so um, we're, we're doing the show. And Lance comes out to be the advisor. But uh, on, on, prior to that, Lance calls me up and he says, Josh, you're sitting down. I go, yeah. He goes, when Lance got out of college, remember when I said when I went back to New York, it was a hiring freeze in New York. Well, at that same time, um, or a couple of years prior, Lance gets out of college, and he takes the test for the New York City Police Department. His father had been a cop, but they're not hiring any, any, any cops anymore because of the city's gone bankrupt. The city was going to do what Donald Trump wants to do, which is to sell off all the assets to, you know, you know Central Park, make it Amazon Park. Let them buy it, let them own it, let them charge you money to go into it. You know, easy. Infrastructure. You don't have to basically pay for it. You want to build a fix a bridge? Call it the Microsoft Bridge. Let them charge money to cross over the Kosciuszko Bridge and it wouldn't cost people a dime. So, 
so they're not hiring. They don't have money for firemen or for policemen. So um, Lance becomes a doctor at the Cleveland Clinic. He's a resident. He calls me. He said, you're sitting down? I go, yeah. He goes, well, um, I just got a letter from the New York City Police Department. They're hiring again. And back, back, back in the day when I took the test, I was near the top of the list. So they want to let me be a police department. He's 30 years old. Now we're 31 years old. I said, well, what are you going to do? And he said, he goes, I'm going to go to New York and be a cop. And I said, are you a doctor? I mean, you're not like leaving. because no, I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor. I'm a resident. I'm a doctor. So he goes to New York uh, and becomes a cop. And as I said, cops are just like doctors. They don't really, you know, sort of talk to people outside the fraternity because there's a lot of stuff that goes on inside the fraternity. But anyway, <clears throat> so you had asked me, you know, that boy, that's a great story. So we did Lance's story and we made the pilot. Um, but nobody believed it. Because while he was a cop in the New York City Police Department, known as Doc, and he was, I rode around in cars with him, they go, hey, Doc, and the people in the precinct would say, hey, Doc, would you take a look at this? Would you take a look at that? I got a little burning sensation. You know, that. And um, while he's doing that, he's also moonlighting at night as a, in an emergency room because he liked medicine, too. He said medicine was maternal and being a cop was paternal, and he liked both sides of it. And he met his wife who was a nurse when he was moonlighting at night in the emergency room. So we wrote this thing about a guy, it's his story, who was a cop during the day and a doctor at night. Yeah, and everybody makes the same joke, shoot you and then patch you up. But nobody believed it. It was like a bad programmer's dream, but it was true. So we did do that, and, and that never, never happened. But that was my friend Lance. Um, so he was, Bruce had offered to make him the medical uh, guy on the show, you know, you, you have to have a medical guy on a hospital show or a medical show. Uh, but he said, no, I'm going to New York to do this thing. So he didn't, and we did, we did a year of St. Elsewhere, and that was a great experience and um, on so many ways, and it was... Um, uh, but the, the episodes we did then were, were dark, mm. you know. I mean, it wasn't... People go into hospitals, and it was often the Patty Chasky thing, you know, bad stuff happens in hospitals. And there's a lot of things that changed, right? A lot the, of, I mean, the direct, the, whole, the director. I mean, Paltrow came, sort of shot well, the pilot, and then sort well, of Paltrow everything didn't shot the pilot. We had a guy. His name was Lou. I can't remember his last name. And a, a number of people got David. The Howie Mandel part was originally played by David Paymer, and he got replaced. Right. And years later, David, who's a wonderful actor, came up to me and said, "I want to thank you." And I said, "Really, thank me?" I said, "For what?" He goes, "For giving me a movie career." Huh. <laughs> and Joseph Summer originally had yeah. the part that Ed Flanders. Had, Landers, and he got right. replaced, and the director, Lou D'Antonio, was replaced. And it was a question of who was going to direct it. And Thomas, <clears throat> who had directed a couple of episodes of The White Shadow, and I think it might have even, have, I don't know if he had done something, another pilot by then. Maybe he had. Uh, I don't know when Miami Vice came out. But um, So I sort of lobbied for Thomas, and John was a friend of Thomas's as well. And Thomas came in and directed the pilot, and that sort of, you know, it was a great thing for his career, and but it was a great thing for the show and a great thing for all of us. And um, but then at the end of that year, I knew that I was going to be going, and and then the show kind of changed. And John Macius, who hadn't been a writer on The White Shadow, became a writer and worked with Tom Fontana and those guys. And we brought Tom in from. Uh, I had met Tom when we were writing the pilot up in Williamstown, and uh, you know, uh, I. I you know, I, I, in my mind, I g gave Tom his first job, and I've read what Tom says that Bruce gave him his first job, but I know that I went into Bruce in my world and said, I'd like to give Tom a job, and Bruce was very happy he'd known Tom, but I never, Tom's never, name never came up in The White Shadow or anything, mm -hmm. and so Tom was there, and he was writing, and then I left, and John didn't have to leave, but he wanted to leave, and so then we sort of were on our own, and... <clears throat> We thought we were going to get a pilot commitment from NBC. We didn't get one, but we then had a deal at Universal. And we didn't really know what we were going to do. I don't remember what happened, but I remember one day I was reading in the trades that there was a little thing that said Steven Spielberg has a, um, an episode of 40, a show of 44 episodes has gotten picked up. And I called my agent, or, or I called one of the executives at Universal, we were sitting around playing darts or going to the batting cage trying to figure out what we could do. And he said, are you interested in this? I said, well, I don't know. I just read it. It's a Universal thing, and you guys I have a contract here. And 
Um, <clears throat> and then the next thing I know, he says, well, Stephen would like to meet you. So we go over to meet his, into his place uh, on the, the Universal lot, and he was a lovely guy uh, to us. And I remember he said, so are you guys fans of um, the Twilight Zones? And I said, um, I, I, I like it, but I'm not a fan. No, I watch the Twilight Zone. I, and he said, you like science fiction? I said, uh, not particularly, you know, I mean... And we just had a nice conversation, and I thought, well, okay, that's sort of the end of that. And I get back, and uh, I get a call, and it says, Sidney Scheinberg, who was the head of Universal, wants to meet with you tomorrow. And so go in to meet with Sidney Scheinberg, and Kathy Kennedy is there, and somebody else is there. And Sidney Scheinberg was the guy who took over Universal from Lou Wasserman. And I remember sitting there, and I don't even know what the show is. You know, it's kind of like... And he goes, so, um, I got this great idea for an episode of Amazing Stories. I'm doing what you're doing. I'm going like, I'm thinking, this is the guy who runs the whole studio. He's wanted to meet with us. What's he? And he tells, proceeds to tell us a story about, I don't know, something like a dog that can talk. And I go, oh. And I walk out of there, and I, it's like a weird meeting. I don't know. I mean, and um, Kathy Kennedy says, so, um, you know, uh, we've had we've had researchers who've been doing a lot of research about different kinds of stories and stuff like that. And I go, well, I, so I guess they wanted us to do this job, you know. And I said, well, it's forty four stories. I'm sure, like Spielberg has lots of stories, and you know, um, you know, uh, he's got lots of stuff, and we can come up with ideas. Because no, 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 Amazing Stories, she says, is a very successful comic book, and it has loads of fans, and we have to stay true to the vision of Amazing Stories. I go, i be honest with you, I've just I've never heard of it, you know. Yeah. And uh, we go back, and they have these researchers, and literally, it was like the Sorcerer's Apprentice, and they go in, and there's this room where these guys have been for like a year and a half, and they literally have floor to they, They'd started with Amazing Stories, and they'd gone through every story in the history of stories since the... Gilgamesh flood or something, and I basically said, Kathy, if I read these stories, I will be reading them for the next five years. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, turn off the tap, I mean, to start with, you know, I mean, this is like crazy. Anyway, so, um, you know, we worked on amazing stories, and it was an extraordinary experience that sort of went beyond, um, you know, making a television show, because I got to work with Martin Scorsese and Clint Eastwood and the best, you know, composers and Sam Waterston did mm -hmm. one. And I mean, it was like an incredible experience and it was an anthology and John would produce one episode and I produced the other. And, you know, so we were like, but again, you know, it goes back to what a producer is. I mean, I remember one time talking with Stephen and, and again, I, I, you know, he wasn't a, a friend of mine, but I liked him and, and, and I think he liked me too. Um, and, and, uh, you know, of course, putting you know, people went crazy when they were around him. I mean, it was just sort of like your life is going to change, like you said. We we're talking about you know, and all of a sudden, oh, and he's going to like like my idea, and then I'm going to be the biggest screenwriter in Hollywood or the biggest director. And so everybody would, he didn't have to do anything when it came to that, and it was just everybody went nuts. And um, but uh, so I forgot what I was going to say, but um, so we would you. I'm trying to think if it was a, a particular conversation, but but we would we got to work with all these incredible people, and 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 he he had a lot of his own ideas, and some of them were very small. There would be like two people become magnetized, and my job was to turn that into a story, or he would have an eight-page story about something, a full. I mean, he would you know, and he was very very involved in all aspects of the show. This is before we had really the internet, yeah. So he would be shooting, I don't know, the color purple or something, we'd be sending him tapes, those big tapes, blockbuster type tapes, and so he could see actors and stuff like that. And, and I always had, and he knew more about television than anybody I'd ever met, you know. Mm -hmm. he, he knew, and he would know shows that were on the same time, at the same night. Mm -hmm. And I would go, and I, in my head, in my head I would, because again, we didn't have... VCR yet. Yeah, and I would picture that he would come home this is my head. Yeah. This is not. And they flip on the light, and there would be like 12 televisions, <laughs> all with something different playing. And he loved television, and he didn't have a, you know, a, 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 
an attitude about it. And he also, and it was interesting because I had, when, when he had sort of met with me and John, and then we had the job. Now, I don't know what kind of due diligence he did or didn't do. I know he had people who I'm sure would, I don't know. But he was a guy who really trusted himself intuitively and instinctively. And I noticed it when, when we started working on it, and I had some friends who were actors, and I recommended them for a part. And they weren't famous, <clears throat> working actors. And Stephen said, have him come in. And he would sit and talk to him for like 10 minutes, and the guy would leave and go, okay, he's good. And he, he, it, was, it was this, um, it wasn't, it, there was no arrogance. It was just, a, it was just a, a, uh, a confidence that he trusted, that he knew, he, he understood, he got something that he needed to get. And he did that with me, and he did that with actors. Obviously, if he's working with a famous actor, you know, uh, he didn't have to do it. But I remember one time, we, he, the one, first one he directed had, um, uh, what's his name, Kevin um, Dances with Wolves. Uh, uh, yeah, Costner. Costner. And he was in the episode. And I remember he was watching and he said, he could have been Indiana Jones. And it was like, nobody knew, you know, he, he just would look at him and say, he could have been Indiana Jones. You know, it was like Harrison Ford obviously was Indiana Jones. But it was like, he just, he just, he just knew it. It was like, it was like for him, it was like riding a bicycle, the whole thing. And, and I remember one time, to, and I was a producer, theoretically. Um, uh, but, I, but I was, except, when, and, and he was directing something. And I remember talking to him and I said, well, you know, so, well, if you do it this way, you can, it'll cost so and so. And if you do it this way, it costs so and so. And you can save $50,000 if you do it this way. And he was really very nice. He just looked at me and I realized, and it was like, ding. It was like, he, he didn't say anything. It was just like, what am I, fuck me? Am I fucking crazy? The guy's made a billion dollars in the studio. He doesn't give a shit if it saves $50,000 or not. He was not a spendthrift. It wasn't like he was trying to spend the money. He just wanted what he wanted. And I realized, well, quite honestly, if I had a grandmother, they were killed in the Holocaust, she could have produced for him, just give him what he wants, is essentially what the job is, you know? And he's not going to say, I want a gold-plated bathroom. He's just going to say, this is what I want to do to do the thing I want to do. Yeah, don't worry me with the money. I don't, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not interested in yeah. what, the, what the thing is. And I'm not, but again, he was a, given how successful he was, at least to me, he was a very grounded person, you know? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and 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 he he you know but it, you know but he, again he had all these protective things around him and people wanted to be part of the fan. I, mean, I had no interest in doing that. I had my own family and I. That's just why did I, you want to do it? I mean, to work with him or to what? If, if I well, to first of all, it was anthology. it was an incredible. It was an anthology, yeah. and so I got to work with Clint Eastwood and Martin Scorsese and. Uh, People who weren't that famous, but Paul Barth, who you know did you know Eating Raoul at the time was a big movie. I mean, it was like, and also I didn't. I had a deal at Universal, and I remember Universal wanted us to do. Um, they were paying us money, me and Falsy, and they wanted us to do this show called Island Sons. And Falsy was nervous, and he said, he said, yeah, I think we should do it. And I said, we can't do it. We can't do the show. Oh, I had a kid. It was like. If we basically go from doing Sane Elsewhere to doing Island Sons, we're never climbing back up onto the high horse. And, but it was a scary time because we didn't have anything. So when this thing happened, it was Spielberg, you know? Mm. It wasn't like it was just some guy who was doing, you know, some genre piece. It was like, who knows what this is going to be? And we got to, you know, he, most of the episodes were his own. Um, and, but he let us do a bunch of them. And, I don't know, we worked with... Sid Caesar. I mean, you know, it was like, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was an experience that went beyond just working on a television show. And we would be in a, I remember he would, sometimes he would have his friends, Robert Zemeckis and Jay Cox, and people would come in there. And so we were working with like really incredibly talented people and just being around them. And I was yeah. still a pitcher. It was just kind of like, I felt like, this is like really cool. And big directors would come in and, you know, we'd have lunch with them and David Cronenberg and it'd be like, wow, this is like really cool. And um, so it was an extraordinary experience. But again, once again, um, I was invited to leave at the end of the first year. What does and that mean exactly? It's fired. You're fired. Yeah. You know, I think that's a phrase that I don't know who I first heard use it. But I like um, that better, of course. But, um, but, but it, but it, the show did not do well. They're not going to fire Steven Spielberg, you know. Mm. So it was kind of, 
you know, and but that was okay. Then it was sort of well, but while we were doing that, it was interesting. Um, Brandon Tartikoff, who was the head of NBC, um, had an idea for an episode. All these guys had episodes they wanted to do, and Spielberg said, "You guys know Brandon?" And I said, "Well," he said, "Work with him on his episode." So we would meet with Brandon, with to do Brandon's episode and write his episode, the episode he wanted to do. Pissed Brandon off because Spielberg never made his episode. He said, he made all these shitty episodes. He's not making my episode. Why wouldn't he make my episode? We didn't know. Anyway, um, and um, but we got to sort of be friendly with him, and he was a nice guy. Didn't he? I heard that he was responsible for saving St. Elsewhere, that it was actually canceled. Were you still there when that happened? I, I wasn't there. The show was very dark, and they wanted, they called us... Um, they the guys on the show, not Dr. Death and Mr. Depression, because there was a lot of, there was a lot of humor, but it was dark humor. And, mm -hmm. and people, a lot of people didn't walk out of that hospital when we were doing it. And I was happy about that because I was basically, again, it's not knowing, it's, 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 it's not knowing, it's, there's an advantage to not knowing enough and there's a disadvantage. The, the advantage was I didn't know how lucky I was. I felt something had been taken away from me. Right, it was your baby. It was my baby, but I didn't know. Wait a second, this is a collaborative medium. <clears throat> Nobody does anything alone. Forget about an auteur theory. There's all different kinds of people. You have to work with other people. And what you don't know, Josh Brand, is in success, there's enough to go around for everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're young and you don't know that, you think, hey, you're taking this away from me. This was mine. And so, in retrospect, I was, I didn't play well with others. Were you just trying to assert your own? No, I just, I was imprint? mad. I was mad. I'm like, why is, why do I have to, this was mine. I basically had this. I sold this to the so-and-so. And, and really what <clears throat> nobody said to me, um, which, which wouldn't even have made sense to me then, which is, the, a show isn't a career. It's, mm. it's, it's another step in a journey. And you will get a lot out of it. And you will get things that will allow other things to happen going forward. It takes a certain maturity and a certain perspective to understand that. I didn't have that. Mm. I didn't go to film school. I didn't know how things worked. I didn't know, you know, if, <clears throat> you know, what the difference was between a supervising producer and a coordinating producer was. I didn't really pay attention to that. I just knew... I. I just knew what I knew as a human being. And so the lack of experience and knowledge and understanding was a good thing. It allowed me to take risks, but it was a bad thing because I basically didn't know. I, it created expectations which weren't real expectations, real obtainable goals given what the scenario was and where I was in the trajectory of the journey, mm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, well, what were you able to imprint? Would you say on that show? I mean, did you have? I'm saying elsewhere. Yeah, the, I, the the characters, the tone, the um, you know, it was prior other than Hill Street, which again had not come out when we started doing it. Multiple stories. I mean, I, I you know, listen. I mean, a lot of the stuff that goes on today in healthcare, it, unfortunately, is still around. And we did an episode. I remember that it was somebody comes into the hospital and is experience has symptoms of something, and they run them through tests. Now the tests. You know, the bill adds up on a typewriter. But I don't know if you've ever looked at a bill, if you've gone to a doctor. It is basically, today, unintelligible. You know, $6,400, you know, but the deduction from the insurance is $5,200, plus the, you know, the, uh, the thing you get in addition to the deduction, the benefit because your so-and-so is another $800, you owe $700, you owe $76. I mean, it's like it's insane. And nobody knows. And then you go, well, how do you break that down? Well, the Band-Aid that they basically gave you was $47.50. And, you know, it's the system is just... And it was so much cheaper then, but I remember there's one scene where the husband and wife go to pay the bill. And they're That's like, right. What you, that was... Our, all of our money. What? That's right. And there was not, and we couldn't, there's that nothing was, wrong with you. That's basically the upshot. But, the, of but it. be thankful there's nothing wrong with you, so pay up. That's right. I mean, but so there were things that were going on in medicine and in hospitals, and they're teaching hospitals in New York. I have a friend who went to teaching hospital in New York, and for a year and a half they told him he had acid reflux, and then they said, whoops, we made a mistake. You have 
metastatic melanoma. I was like, how do they miss that? Well, you know what? These things happen. And you know what? And, and you know, uh, I, by friends who are doctors who say, listen, it's a insane messed up system. Everyone feeds it the trough. The doctors, the insurance companies, the patients, mm -hmm. you know, and nobody wants to give up anything. And it's, and so now we're still dealing with the same stuff that was being dealt with in St. Elsewhere. And we dealt with those kinds of things. And, um, and, and it was not a melodrama. It was a melodrama, but in the sense that good things are melodramas. I mean, it wasn't The Godfather, which is the greatest melodrama of all time, maybe, but um, it, 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 you know, it wasn't like, oh, I'm being raped in the hallway kind of a thing. And it was, and, and yet it was, um, and so it was what I wanted it to be. And of course, my litmus test was Lance. And Lance said, hey, you know what? This isn't embarrassing to me. The doctors like this. This feels... You're getting that feedback. It yeah. feels like it has a certain degree of verisimilitude, that this mm -hmm. is what's, you know, uh, you know, like, you know, there was a thing in early on, you know, the thing of playing music in a, in a uh, operating room. Go into an operating room. There would be Bruce Springsteen, headbutting one surgeon, headbutting another surgeon across the operating table. It was real. It was it was funny, it was crazy, but so, it was real. So is what they're doing. <laughs> it's what it's what they're doing. I mean, yeah. it was and 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 talking to doctors about that. And I remember, you know, uh, David Morris had a had a had a monologue in in the pilot about how he gets w woken from his dream. About uh, and and I that was Lance. It was just Lance. It was they had created a system where, where all these young doctors would work forty eight hours straight without sleeping. What job can you do well if you haven't slept in forty eight hours? I hear in my business they go, "Hey man, page one rewrite. You know how to work on the last thirty six hours." And you want to go? Well, no wonder the script is a piece of shit. You know, I mean, who can do anything good when they're working forty? Why do they work forty hours? Eight hours? It's enough to pay them. You know, it's, it's, so it, that was the system, and Patty Chayefsky nailed it in hospital, and we're still, that's still what it is, going to an emergency room. You know, I had, my wife had to go into an emergency room. She fell when she was running. I mean, it's, it's insane. It's just insane. I mean, I, she fell, broke a wrist in Ireland. We had to go into an emergency room. It's the most civilized thing in the world, you know? It's like $100, $100, well, don't you want to know what they have to do? No, it's $100 for whatever they do you know, put the cast on, you want an operation, it's a hundred, it's like, what? <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, so it's, it's a, so, so that's the imprint, and, uh, you know, uh, people love the show, and, the, you know, we had, you know, a lot of the characters were, remained, and then they introduced new characters, and, you know, the show ran, you know, for years and years and years, and you know, I'm sure it changed. And uh, did you I, watch it after? Yeah. You know, I don't. But I don't really watch any show that I've left. I don't really watch, and mm. it's not because I. I just find it hard to watch. I mean, otherwise, it's. Um, and one of the things I've, I've. Another thing I've learned is. It's one of the reasons why I've enjoyed working on the Americans, where it's not my show. Um, I'm a consultant, consulting producer, and of course, when I started on it, I mean, I'm sure you'll get to that on some mm. level, but you know. <clears throat> they said, well, so, okay, Josh, you can be an executive producer. I don't want to be an executive producer. You know, well, co-executive, no, I don't want to be a co-executive producer. I'd like to be a creative consultant. Well, they don't give that title that anymore. I say, okay, uh, consulting producer. They said, yes, but if the show wins an Emmy, you don't get an Emmy. And I said, okay, I'll still take consulting producer. These guys are lovely. If the show wins an Emmy, they made sure I would get an Emmy. Um, you can, get, but, but, but the point was that, that, and it goes back to, even saying elsewhere, why I behave badly. It isn't about when you feel something is yours, it isn't that you love it more. It isn't like you love a biological child more than an adopted child. It's ego identification. It's when it's, so for example, if, if you have a pet and you're going out of town, you ask me to take care of your dog, and you say, I don't feed my dog treats. I won't feed your dog treats because it's your dog. If it's my dog, I'm gonna give him treats whenever I want to give him treats, you know? So when you separate yourself from it and say, it's not mine, I don't have that proprietary interest in it, it's yours, it's freeing. Mm. It doesn't mean that you care less, it doesn't mean that you try less hard, it just means that you don't feel something's being taken away from you, which is what I felt in St. Elsewhere. And, uh, um, and, um, and I, and I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry, you know, guys, I apologize for acting badly.
I do. Um, it was not your fault. And uh, I didn't know, and I felt that something was, somebody had taken my dessert or something. Yeah. So, um, but, I, but I loved doing it, and I loved doing the stories, and there were, you know, uh, you know funny things of, you know, uh, I, I didn't, I, I participated in casting, but Bruce would be, you know, when actors were replaced, he was talking to the network, we didn't. But we got to do the stories that we wanted to do. And even though some of them were real dark, he didn't basically say, you can't do these stories because they're too dark. But when we were gone, people said they lightened up the show, and it's one of the reasons they brought the show back, that they, they told the network that they were not going to make it as depressing or whatever it was. But, but it, I got to make the show that I wanted to make, and that was always the thing that was most important to me. And again, it goes back to I didn't know how difficult or not difficult it would be to ever do this again. I didn't know. I didn't know if... Well, just do another show, or if it would never happen again, which is frequently the case. Yeah. Um, so, and, and and I think if I would have known more, I would have been more frightened. I don't think it would have been more liberating. I think I would have been more afraid to. I would have done Island Sons. I would have, right. you know, I would have done it, but I didn't. I didn't. I didn't know enough. Not. I didn't know enough to, um, you know, to say that. So, so fortunately, I think that I got really, and it is luck, whatever luck is, but, um, <clears throat> you know, a, a, so when we got to work with Brandon, and after we got fired from the Spielberg show, Brandon called, uh, called us up and said, listen, I, don't, I think we had a pilot script we developed about a family show or something, but <clears throat> he said, look, I can do, I'd like to do this. I'd like to do a show on this family, but it's, but it's, I can only air it at Christmas time. This is a year in the life. Yeah. He said, I can only do it at Christmas time. Can you guys deliver it in Christmas time? And we said at this point, yes is a better word than no. <laughs> sure. And we had to do six hours. We didn't have the scripts. I can't remember how much time we had. We had to start shooting, I don't know, in October. It's like August. We don't have any scripts. And what we know is, I don't remember why, but we were going to shoot three weeks in Seattle, Washington, and after finishing those three weeks of scenes in all six episodes, we were then going to come back to L.A. Where, while they were building our sets and finish everything that needed to be filled in from the stuff that we hadn't shot in Seattle. Well, that meant you had to know what was going to happen in all six hours. I was going to say, that's quite a logistical... Feet. Yeah. yeah, you know, you had to, and we didn't have any scripts, so we just started working, and I remember we would be up in Seattle, and we would just be saying, here's a scene, and this would go, and we figured out, you know, what the, you know, the progression would be for the six hours, because, because, and I, I always wondered, I don't know if, if Brandon, I don't know why he sort of gave us that, I don't know if he sort of, he liked the idea, and he liked the story. He was pissed off that Spielberg never made his episode. He kind of liked us because he liked us when he was working with us. I don't really know why, but he did, and he made it, and he put it on. And it was a, what it also taught me, which was helpful, <clears throat> is you can do anything. You can do anything. Never say no until you have to pull out the no card. <laughs> never. Because he would have said, you can't. We don't have any scripts. You're going to write scenes in episode five. You don't even have an episode five. You're shooting them in Seattle in a story that you don't even know. You know the broad outlines of the story, and you're going to make it work, and it won the Emmy. I know. You know? And as my friend Robin Green says, beat wins a war. I mean, it was like, you know, it was just this family thing, and it was a great experience. And I think, you know, for... for you know, John Falsey, I think people always ask, you know, sort of, you know, because we had five shows and one of them going to extremes, which is an incredible experience, you know, but of the St. Elsewhere and Northern Exposure and I'll Fly Away, which, and, and, and also A Year in the Life, um, I, I think, you know, and I, and, and, I, and Falsey isn't here and he would, and we both, we were partners, we both worked on everything together, but um, he always, love that family stuff. I think he would have been very happy to just spend his career doing a family show. And I got bored. I like 
it's in elsewhere, and I like northern. I like different things of doing. And I think that's, that's sort of the basic dichotomy. It doesn't mean that he didn't work on northern or didn't work on St. Elsewhere. It just means that he loved John Updike. He loved, you know, John Cheever. He, that's what he was, he, he was very, very happy doing that. And even when we got to I'll Fly Away, the thing that most interested in me was, like, I didn't want to do another family show. I wanted to, like, but I love, I, I, I said, what I did, I talked myself into thinking, it's a show that takes place in South Africa today. So it's about race and class, even though it's America in the 50s, 1950s. Right. And, and of course, the, and I'm sure we haven't gone to that, but the genesis of that was just, you know, um, you know, was To Kill a Mockingbird. And there's a scene in To Kill a Mockingbird where uh, Gregory Peck has to go to the courthouse and it's like 11 o'clock at night or something and he goes to the woman who takes care of his kids and he says, listen, would you be able to stay late tonight? I've got to go down to the courthouse. And he goes, absolutely. Yes, sir. And I thought, okay, I mean, I know she's staying, but what's her life like? You know, I mean, because it's dropped and he goes on and it's all thing and he's the liberal guy. And so that's sort of, that was the part that was interesting to me, but to Falsey, sure. it was much more just the family dynamics were mm -hmm. something that he was sort of very, very, uh, you know, um, that he loved. Um, so we did A Year in the Life, and then uh, it got picked up as a, um, a series, and that was a family show, and all of a sudden the kids came into it were in the miniseries, they, they weren't. And Thomas Carter directed all six episodes. And but you directed, I thought, one of... I directed an episode of the series. That was yeah. my first where I started to direct. I had wanted to, again, one of the things I learned, it was <clears throat> say yes, and it was sort of like, you're a writer in television. Uh, it's a natural progression to be a producer because, and a producer, 60% of what a producer does or 70 or 80 or 50 is what a director does. And so, and then it was, if you're given the opportunity, excuse me, say yes. I mean, maybe you'll like doing it, maybe you won't like doing it. And so I did direct my first episode there. And of course I went to my friends Thomas and uh, to say, well, how do you do this? What do I have to worry about? And I remember Thomas on a yellow sheet of paper, which he still have wrote down things I should lenses to use. You remember anything he told you specifically? He said, "Well, it, remember this is when the television set was square." Mm -hmm. He said, "Long lenses, you know, may, are more flattering in close-ups because the backgrounds fall away." And, and you know, I don't, you know, he had or moving masters, you know, which uh, you know, you know, like you you spend your time sort of uh, orchestrating a master shot, but don't make it just static, have it turn into different shots, becomes a two shot or an over or a single, and then you sort of fill in the blanks. And um, so it takes more time to do that at first, but it'll save you time. And so, and it also makes it more interesting for your eye. Um, so there were a bunch of things like that that were very helpful to me. And, um, but he did an incredible job on the, on the miniseries and, uh, uh, and and it, and it was and something we were both enormously proud of and and uh, <clears throat> and then the show got canceled and quite honestly I mean I I remember Richard Kiley who was mm. you know the loveliest guy and we were shooting the miniseries and he broke two ribs on his bicycle and he was 64 at the time I'm 66 and he seemed really old to me then <laughs> and he didn't want to be flown to new york to be seen by a doctor he just basically saw a doctor there and basically got on his bicycle two days later and kept riding and it was like he was just a great guy and and i remember this is a, a funny so the, the first time i directed an episode the first shot i had we had um geraldine fitzgerald who had been a movie star and had worked with you know um I mean, some of the greatest directors ever. And this was back in the day when, you know, you had a, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't digital and you didn't have Video Village, but so you had a monitor that you could watch and you'd be near the monitor. And I remember Geraldine said to me, she just called me over and she said, please don't watch that, please just look at me. And I said, sure. And then she, when she had acted, they didn't have monitors and directors would just basically be there. And, and she had worked with like, uh, you know, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, not Ilya Kazan, but uh, William Wyler. And William Wyler was known for doing like 60 takes of, of a scene to break down an actor. He really wow. wanted to break them down. Of course, you can't do that in television if you wanted to. Not that you'd want to, but if you did, you couldn't. And uh, so anyway, so and, and she was this lovely, beautiful, she was like 80 or something. She was playing Richard Kiley's mother. 
No, Richard Kiley's girlfriend's mother. Anyway, Richard Kiley is sitting there at her bed, and there's a mirror there. And of course, being the first directing thing, it's the corniest thing in the world, maybe, I guess. Uh, it was the mirror shot. And of course, mirrors change the sides that, yeah. you know, the line of how you're shooting. And so I have this shot that's set up that's going to reflect Kylie through the mirror as he's sitting by the side of the bed. I don't remember. Anyway, so I basically have the shot lined up. It's my first shot of anything I've ever directed. And I <clears throat> set it up and Dick Kylie says, Josh, Josh, and I go, he goes, that's my bad side. And I go, <coughs> okay. This figures first shot, I'm on a crew, the crew's gonna, it's like grip wax. They're gonna like basically, that's hysterical, Dick, that's great. Uh, anyway, okay, so let's go. And he goes, Josh. I go, he goes, it's my bad side. I go, Listen, Dick, that's really hysterical. I get it. Uh, I know. Uh, you guys, thanks, guys. I'm, I'm a schmuck. I get it. Thanks. You've been all been terrific. He said, but we really have to go. And he goes, it's my bad side. He had a toupee. And it was the side of his toupee that the had the... There. And I was like, mm. oh. And I'm not a good guy. I'm not a mathematical guy. It was like, I'm thinking if I put the mirror over there and I get, how does that change the whole thing? I couldn't figure out how to do it. And he looked at me and he saw the look on my face <laughs> and he said, it's okay, just shoot it. You know, it was, and that was the first, it, but it was, it was, he was just a great guy and yeah. he was, and I've been very fortunate that Sam Waterston, John Cullum, these guys are theater guys. They basically are, you know, just John Cullum, you could tell him whatever. You, you could tell him how you want to say the line. You could do anything you want. The only thing you couldn't do is bring him on the set and not know where you want him to stand. It's the only thing. And and Sam also. These are guys who I'm. Sam Waterston won an Academy Award. Asked him to play. Say, listen, I, I, you know, you're playing this guy, and the bottom line is, he's a weak guy. And Sam goes, that's what I do. Hmm. It was a movie star, and it was like, you know. And that, that's who they were as people, and that's how they viewed their craft and mm -hmm. how they, they... So I was in, and John were incredibly lucky to work with them. So after A Year in the Life gets canceled, we get a call from Universal. They have a commitment. Um, do we have any ideas for a, a, for a show? You had an overall deal with them, or what kind of a deal do you have with them? It was an overall deal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was... Yeah, we had an overall deal. So... <clears throat> Um, we come up with what became Northern Exposure, and and uh, you know. Please detail that. <laughs> well, people always say, yeah. I mean, well, I can I can you know what I say is uh, there's a couple of things. One is I was a big fan of the movie um, Local Hero. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen. I can't remember his name. A Scottish director, and he did Gregory's Girl, and uh, I, I wish I could remember. I normally remember his name. And the tone of that movie, I just fell in love with it, a character-driven show. And, uh, and then I had seen a, a movie called Never Cry Wolf, which uh, Carol Ballard directed, which is, you know, these are, I guess, both fish out of waters. In, in Local Hero, Peter Riegert plays a guy working for Broke Lancaster, in, uh, an oilman, and he has to go to this village in Scotland, and he has to buy out the village so they can drill oil on it. And all the Scottish people are these crazy, wacky, odd characters, but not crazy like broad. Just, there's nothing like it. I mean, just a Bill Forsyth, that's the director of him. He made like three or four movies that were just brilliant. And then he tried to make a transition to sort of an American popular movie and didn't hit. But, um, and, and in Never Cry Wolf, um, Charles uh, Martin Smith plays a guy working in, um, he's an academic in Boston who goes sent to uh, somewhere in Alaska, someplace, to study wolves. And the thing that was so striking about that, other than it's incredibly beautiful to look at, and it's another fish-out-of-water story, and he has to get food and live in a freezing place, but it was the depiction of the Native Americans, and I'll call them Indians because, as I'll tell you a story about that when I, because I directed the Northern Pilot, Northern Exposure Pilot, but <clears throat> they were, I'd never seen them depicted like that, ever, and in anything. They were real. And they were these two guys, and they were out, and they wind up killing the wolf to get. They don't have. They have shitty teeth, and then they have beautiful teeth at the end. The wolf teeth. No, they have. They have, you know, bridge work done. Oh. 
they kill the wolf, they sell, sell the it. pelt, and now they've got great teeth and they're nice guys. But they're they were like they were like not you know they were just they were just it goes to being an outsider. Were, I just had never seen people like that ever depicted on television right. ever, or, or in a movie. So those two things were seminal. My friend Lance, again, is now a doctor cop, but he's up in a small town in uh, Schoharie, New York, and I would visit him. And it wasn't Northern Exposure, but he was a guy living in a small town in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York and had a VFW place that he bought and turned into his you know, medical practice. And he had horses and dogs in the middle of nowhere. And there was another, anyway, those were the things that were, and so came up with this, and I didn't want to do another doctor show. I, I was like, I was not going to do that. But I knew that if you say a doctor in Alaska, why Alaska? Because, you know, they, they had talked about, you know, did we want to do it in uh, some other place? Because we knew we couldn't shoot in Alaska, and we said, nah, it's really got to be Alaska. you got to feel like what? it's Alaska. It's a new frontier. It's mm -hmm. where everybody goes to recreate themselves. It's everything that's loose that isn't tied down ones up there. So it would be a fun place to do it. Then, of course, we had to figure out where we could shoot it. And we went to Colorado, and we couldn't. We went to Seattle, and went to towns. We couldn't find a place. And I remember the location manager said, well, i got one more place to show you. And took us to the town of Roslyn, which was 60 miles away from Seattle, over the Schoharie Pass, over the mountains, over the Cascades. And once we saw the town, and in the town, the first, it's one main street, and there was that mural painted on the wall of the camel that said Roslyn. And I remember there, I just turned to him, and I said, well, the town was found by, and we knew that we knew that we were going to call the place Sicily. We had to, you know, but not like Sicily Tyson. I said Sicily and Roslyn, they were two lesbos, and they basically found this town, and they basically that's how the town came about. Well, that and just immediately. It came just to... happened. It was the minute we saw it was Roslyn. We said, well, that's it. That's the whole story of the whole thing. And we said, great, this is going to work. And then of course, how are we going to do it? But, and this goes back to yes is a better word than no, which I think is probably thematically the point of this whole conversation for me is. <clears throat> everybody told me not to do it. My agents told me not to do it. My lawyer told me not to do it. They said, first of all, you're not getting any money to make it. Second of all, nobody's going to see it. Nobody did summer replacement shows. And so it's a waste of your time. It's just, it's just don't do this. Not gonna, and there, there was no money to do it. Universal made it non-union. Because it was non-union, they had to hire another... They didn't, it didn't say Universal Television. It said we had to hire some guy, who would, a non-union guy. We had to go up to Seattle um, to shoot it. We didn't have money for a real crew. They would say, hey, you know, you want to be a key grip? You're a key grip. And I was directing it, and they didn't want me to direct it. And I think they didn't want me to direct it because they were afraid that I, was, I was having too much power in my hands or something. But I said, fuck it, I'm not doing it if I don't direct it. And they wouldn't, you know, they said, well, we're, not gonna, we're only going to pay you for an episode. The minimum, I said, I don't care. I wanted to do it. Why so badly, were you sure? Because it was, it go, it, it was proprietary for me. Yeah, I think of all the shows that I did for me, I mean, I loved St. Elsewhere because I loved learning things. I'm a reader, and I loved learning about Munchausen's disease, and I loved, you know, learn, you know, coming up with crazy things. But this was it was closest to who I am. I mean, I have I'm interested in ideas, you know. Um, I can read about them. I like to talk about them. I like to think about them, and I'm interested in seeing things that are different. You know, we were going to see something that was going to look different than anything on television. I'm interested in challenges. How are you going to shoot it on a distant location? I have a family now. I have two kids. You know, I'm not going to live there. Um, so all of those things appealed to me, and I loved it, and I loved the script. And I, um, <clears throat> so I wanted to do it. And I also kind of figured out by that time in my life, I was in, I don't know, 30-something, that anytime somebody is going to give you money to do something you want to do, say yes. I mean, even if it's not enough, <laughs> because you don't know what's going to yeah. happen. You don't know. It's just it's it's ridiculous, you know. To was say, it even feasible the amount of money they gave you for? No, well, but no. It was it was eight hundred. We caught we made the population of the town eight hundred twenty nine because they gave us eight hundred twenty nine thousand dollars. I just I, last I did a western a few years ago. They gave us nine million dollars. I mean, so mm. it's not a lot of money to shoot, and, and literally had a non union crew. And had you know non-union producer, and uh, but made the pilot and um, 
and then they did eight episodes. Um, the you wrote fourth the pilot, sorry, you wrote the pilot with... I wrote John. the pilot with John. And, uh, can, but, you, can you talk just for briefly about just the process of how you wrote together? Like, did one person talk, the other wrote? <clears throat> like, how did you... Well, we, we basically were in the room together. Mm -hmm. well, what we would do, we were, we were different than, you know, for example, the guys who work on the Americans. When we were in the... When you're writing a pilot, um, you don't know what the show is. I mean... You know, if I'm writing it with you, you don't have a window into your head, and I don't have one in mine, so you can't see what I'm seeing. And so you sit in the room, and you basically we would work it out. And at that point, we had your yellow pad, and one person would hold the yellow pad, and the other person would pace around and talk. Excuse me. And then we would give the yellow pad to our assistant, who would type it up. You know, or on the computer. I don't remember when that came into it. And then as we went on, as the show went on, we would then split up. We didn't, we was, because we were both, we're both lazy guys. We both basically, we did not see, we did not believe in having redundancy where the two of us did the same thing. Mm. So he would work on something. And we kind of learned that from The White Shadow, where he would, we were not partners. And we learned it from amazing stories when it was an anthology. So he would work on one episode, I would work on the other. Um, so when we did, when we did the six hour miniseries, we did that together because First of all, we had those three weeks, and we had to do it together. And we liked being with each other, and we would yell at each other and scream, and then we'd walk out, so, oh, what do you have lunch? And everybody would look like, you know, but we were very good friends, and we, um, we enjoyed each other's company enormously. And uh, we'd go to the batting cage and stuff like that. We, he was a sporty guy, too. <clears throat> and um, so we would write it together, and then we would... And, and he was very supportive of my directing, and uh, uh, he never wanted to direct. That was not a goal or had no, zero interest in doing it. And uh, it's interesting, though, because we were friends. We were at Universal a lot with these guys, um, Levinson and Link. I don't know if you've heard of them. But um, <clears throat> um, uh, who was Bill and who was... Uh, William Link? Yeah, yeah, and Bill Levinson. Anyway, they were great guys. They were great guys. And they had done, they created Columbo. They made some of the greatest TV movies ever made. When TV, they're like independent movies now. They did that certain summer with Martin Sheen, which is about a gay guy. They did one about, you know, the, um, uh, the only American soldier ever executed after World War II. I mean, they did really great stuff. And they were brilliant guys and funny guys and great guys. And they'd known each other since they were in high school. And I said, well, how have you guys always stayed together? And he said, neither one of us ever wanted to direct. So, um, but I did. I would get bored and I would go, not, you know, and I'd say, I don't know if I'm going to like this or I'm not going to like it, but I want to do it. You know, why not? And um, so I did it. I directed the pilot. And then <clears throat> we, um, so they did eight episodes. And then all of a sudden it was, popular. Somehow people had found this summer show that didn't have any money. And um, and I remember we the fourth episode we did in the first eight was a, a crazy one where we introduced Adam Arkin and he was a uh, mm. some weirdo, you know, chef, crazy guy out in the middle of the woods. There was a, a legend about him. And I remember I, we loved that episode and it was it was in our head, it was in, certainly in my head, it was like, we could do anything we want to do on this show. Yeah. And the network was terrified. And they said, well, okay, 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 but can we air it number eight? It was supposed to be number four. And we said, air it any number you want to air it, but you're going to air it. So we'll air it number eight. And then everybody loved it. And it was like, it was kind of like going back to St. Elsewhere when you had people, doctors talking, you don't understand what they're saying. It doesn't matter. You know, if they're, they get, they get, they get the way a dog gets what you're saying when knows how you feel about them by your, by your tone, by your, you, the, human beings are the same way, we're no different, we pick up what we need to pick up to believe it, to be invested in it, to believe it. And, um, and so then they ordered another eight. Did that surprise you though, that people were getting what you were writing, that you were, fi you were finding that audience? Did it surprise you given, you know, the terms people were saying, it, it, quirky, it, you know, that term? Well, that it, were... it surprised me, uh, well, in, in saying elsewhere, it was a, it was a great learning experience. Um, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll just, I'll, can I take a brief detour? Oh, of course. <clears throat> Along this time, yeah. this was saying, uh, 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 Northern Exposure is going and it's become a big hit. It was a critical hit. It's the only show that I did that was a critical hit. It was a top 20 show and sometimes a top 10 show. And it was a, 
it, it, was, it was a commercial hit, is what I'm saying, and it was also a critical hit. The critics loved it. I mean, it was like everybody loved it. And um, so that gave us tremendous kind of uh, juice in the business. And at this, and I was, we were represented by CAA, and CAA w decided, Mike Ovitz decided, he didn't tell me he decided this, but in some way he decided that he was going to put advertising agencies out of business. That if you were Coca-Cola and you wanted to make Coca-Cola commercials, you don't need an advertising agency. Come to me, and I'm going to give you, um, uh, you know, my, I don't know, big directors. I'm going to give you uh, uh, Rob Reiner, and I'm going to give you a couple of guys. I'm going to give you Josh Brand and John Falsey. So they came to us and they said, do you want to do a Coca-Cola commercial? And Falsey, God bless him, said, yeah. And I said, I keep saying God bless him. I'm not a, not a religious whatever, but, uh, you know, uh, heaven help us. Um, and um, so we were hired to do a Coca-Cola commercial that we were going to write and create and that I was going to direct. And because it was this big deal that Mike Ovitz was going to put out, put you know all the advertising agencies were going to become irrelevant and expendable. Why do you need the middleman to basically do it? You have a product, Microsoft. Just go to CAA, and we're going to give you the most creative guys in Hollywood, and they're going to do it. Okay. So we come up with this story that doesn't have any words, and we storyboard the whole thing, and we go to Italy. And they've got to pay me, I forgot what it's called, my lawyer said, they've got to pay me what they pay everyone. So I got to get, they, they had to pay me what they paid Rob Reiner. They had to pay me whatever they paid the top directors in Hollywood to do these things, they had to pay me. It was the best job I ever had. Two weeks in Tuscany, doing a 30 second or 60 second commercial. The DP was Jean de Bont, who had became, a, afterwards became a very successful director, and he was a big DP who did big, big movies. And I had a German crew following me around to do a, you know, a German documentary of the making of this commercial. And I had these two actors. One was a Spanish dancer. One was an Italian guy. And they didn't speak any English. So there I am going, a destra, sinistra. I'm having a ball. Anyway, we make this thing. And I go back in the editing room. And I must, and the editor and I must have seen the commercial a thousand times. The only thing Coca-Cola cared about was the guy, when he drinks the Coca-Cola, his Adam's apple, is it moving the way they wanted it? So when we got to that shot, I was like, okay, because all of a sudden, then all of the people from Coca-Cola and everybody would like, go right to the monitor. I mean, they didn't care about the rest of the stuff. You, you know, have a ball, guys, make a night of it. You know, is that one good? The guy would be throwing up from drinking all this Coca-Cola. And um, so we got back, and the editor is, and, I, and he must have looked at it a thousand times, and I must have looked at it a thousand times, and Coca-Cola must have looked at it a thousand times. And one day, and they were going to, they showed it in the Academy Awards, you know, it was on television, they showed it in movie theaters, and I, one day, I'm watching it again, I don't remember why, probably because, why not, and I'm looking at it, and I freeze it, and I go, What? Okay, here's the shot. It's a it's a it's a voyeurism. There's, a, there's this handsome glass blower, an Italian guy, who's blowing up a thing in his shop in in Italy. And what he's going to blow up is a Coca Cola bottle. Mm -hmm. And there's this beautiful girl riding a bicycle, and she sees him, and she looks through the window, and she watches him. What he does at the end, he's got this big long tube, and he basically <laughs> has, and at the end is a Coca Cola bottle. And what he does is he breaks off the Coca Cola bottle, and there he holds it up. And puts it, puts it down or something. And I look at it and I go, shit. The thing that he's blowing it from is about seven feet long. And he's breaking it off. And his other hand is there. What's holding up the big, long thing? The point is, he couldn't have done what he did on camera. And no one ever, 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 ever saw it. Yeah. And I learned something. I learned something, and it goes back to the thing you were asking or saying about learning about when the doctor, when Fiscus, Howie Mandel gave this long speech about how he killed somebody in a way that you get he did something bad, but you don't know what he did. It's, 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 the, it's the basis of all magic tricks, which is what making television movies is. It's the most unrealistic, most fake 
process of anything, and yet when you watch it, it's the only one that looks really real. It's not like a play where the guy goes to the window and goes, I see the ships coming in on your own. He's looking out a window on a, on a stage. And so I learned the same way that it's, there's a figure and there's a ground, and the eye can only look at one thing. Yeah. So if you're watching the thing, or if you're listening to the thing, you're not, you're not seeing, if I'm doing a magic trick, I've, I've got to know what you're looking at so I can do the thing that I want to do that you're not looking at. And so that's what I kind of learned, and it's related to, you know, to, to, uh, to, what act, to, to when you're writing something that's, you, you can't understand what people are saying in a spy thing, but you know they're spies, or you're, it, it, it was this, and I learned something, and I learned something, and I said, it, it's physiological. It's not, you know, the way we absorb things. It's like when they're saying it's a dog. You pick something up without, you know, the, the network executives would say, oh, we don't understand what he's talking about. It goes, it doesn't matter. You don't want to do the whole script like that, obviously, but a little bit of that tells the audience that these people are good at what they do, and that's all the audience cares about. They don't care if they're nice people. Tony Soprano's not nice. They care that they're good at what they do. Because if you're not good at what they do, then they're not really interested in you. Mm. Um, and uh, so, okay, so we did Northern Exposure. I mean, it's I I did 66 episodes of that, um, but it lasted five years because they did eight. It was like a it was like a cable show. They did eight, and then they did eight, and I got to do anything I wanted to do. I literally, they at some point where it, you know, I was going to get fired from that too, and and I basically. Agree. They flew me. I agreed to because I did something where I broke the fourth wall, and they didn't want me to do it. And it was an episode where the Russian guy they had a duel, and the characters go, "Well, he can't obviously kill him." I mean, you know, it's like, and then they just walk off. So it was a version of breaking the fourth wall, and they didn't want me to air that. They said they would lose the audience, and I said, "I don't care." You know, I just want to. It's it's great. It's funny. It's terrific. And they aired it. But at the end of that year, they flew me to New York, and Jeff Sigansky. The guy who had come to see my play, who gave me an episode of the Jimmy Breslin show, was the head of the network. Mm -hmm. And he always wanted it to be, he thought it was a doctor show. He thought we were going to call it Dr. Snow. He said, where are the medical stories? Where are the medical stories? There's no medical stories in this show. And it was, I couldn't tell him, but I was going to be, I have, I'm not doing a medical show. I, I will throw up. And of course, once it became successful, he didn't care. He said, don't do medical stories. But they basically wanted me to say, are you, are you going to be a good boy? I mean, are you going to basically, because, and I, I said, I'll be a good boy. I kissed the ring. And I went back to L.A. and I thought about it and I said, and I went to Falsy and I said, I can't do this. I'm not doing this. Mm. I'm sorry. And, I, and I, I wasn't being, I wasn't negotiating. I wasn't being a wise guy. I just, I didn't want to do it. I just didn't want to do it. It was like, I loved it. I loved what I was doing. And so I called my agent. He said, he said, he said, fine. And he, he wasn't as comfortable with the show. It wasn't his wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. and, and he, but he was a good friend. And it was, he just said, so fuck it. We're out of there. I called my agent. He said, are you serious? What, do, you, do, you want, do, you want, do you want more money? And I said, no, I don't want more money. I just don't want to do it. And basically, the studio called me up a day later and said, OK, you can do whatever you want to do as long as you're not asking us for more money. Wow. I said, you got a deal. And then they let me do whatever I wanted to do. And then I left after five years. And the reason I left, it was quite simply, um, I felt like I was repeating myself. And I, not to be precious about it, I just didn't want to do that. I kind of loved it. And I said, I've gotten to do everything I want. I, I read an article once about some guy in, I don't know if he was in Europe or Canada, who built a, a trebuchet, who built a... Um, the catapult? Yeah. He built catapults. And he used to, and, and I said, let's do that in the show. Great episode. And I, and I brought him in, mm -hmm. and he built a catapult, and I said, I just want to see you do fling something in this catapult. And we flung a piano, and we made a tape of it where we practiced it. And it's the most amazing thing. We saw the G-forces on the piano as the piano breaks up mm -hmm. in midair. So I, I got to, I saw, you know, I can't remember the mime, Bill, a um, wonderful mime, and I just said, well, just, just put him in the show. And he came up, and we did a love story with him in Mal Marilyn, and... You know, and and and, but but it, but it, but it, I said, you know, I don't really I don't really want to do this anymore because I, I I don't know. I mean, maybe if I could take a year off or something and mm. recharge my batteries. And Falsey didn't want to do it because they. I said, well, I'll do thirteen if you'll do half of them. And he said, no. I, he said he was it was not his thing. And so uh, that was that was uh, that. But while we were doing it, we also sold 
I'll fly away. Mm -hmm. And we saw going to extremes. And Les Moonves, who is the head of CBS, and uh, he was the head of Warner Brothers, and we then had a deal at Warner Brothers and at CBS. Um, and at ABC, right? And at ABC. So we went to NBC and we pitched them, I'll fly away and going to extremes. I want to take a quick break. Yeah, sure. Is that okay? Because um, I 